to close up this section, uh, after we've discussed how data is represented in, uh, in a Java implementation and how procedures are represented, uh, we're now going to focus on how we actually execute the code and uh, the runtime environment that Java provides and uh, a, a topic of uh, virtual machines uh, that help us with this kind of code. So first, let's, uh, uh, let's talk about implementing programming languages. There's actually many choices to how to implement uh, programming models. Uh, for the most part in this course, we've talked about compilation, uh, taking a C program, compiling it into assembly language instructions, which in turn are further compiled into the actual machine code that runs on our, on our CPU. But we can also interpret a language. And by interpret, we mean actually execute it line by line in the original source code so we don't go through these uh, extra translation steps. So there's obviously a lot less work for the compiler uh, to do. In fact, we don't have a compiler at all. We have an interpreter. And uh, all the work is done at runtime. This makes code a lot easier to debug because we're always working off of the source code. We're not looking at uh, machine code instructions or assembly language instructions that lose a lot of the context that we might have had in our original code. It's also easier to make languages run on different architectures because essentially we're running the program in a simulated environment that is part of the interpretation of the language. So rather than having to know what the detailed instructions are uh, that the CPU can execute, those machine code instructions, uh, we can just interpret the language directly. Interpreted languages have a long, long history. Actually, one of the first programming languages called Lisp uh, was an interpreted language. And there's still many interpreted implementations uh, very much with us today. Uh, not only Java, but also Python, JavaScript, Ruby, MATLAB, a lot of languages you might have uh, heard of uh, mentioned. So there's actually a continuum from in fully interpreted languages like Lisp to compiled languages like C. Java sits somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's partly compiled and partly interpreted. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that Java programs are compiled into an intermediate language uh, that is run by a virtual machine. It's not a real architecture. There's no CPU that actually executes those instructions. But it's very easy for us to interpret those instructions on any CPU. So it's kind of this intermediate level of programming language a partly compiled language, if you will. And for Java, it's called a bytecode because it tries to pack instructions into single bytes. Uh, Java can also be compiled ahead of time, just like C is, and turned into a target machine code for a particular CPU. Uh, we refer to those, uh, uh, those are compilers, and they can be either at uh, compile time, ahead of time, or they can be just-in-time compilers. So if we look at this uh, pictorially, we have a high-level language program written in a language like Java, uh, a native machine language, the code, the machine code and instructions for a particular CPU, and the virtual machine language sits somewhere in the middle. So we can have a bytecode compiler that turns our high-level language into this virtual machine language. From there, we can go to different uh, CPUs, uh, for example, and uh, easily retarget our code. That can be done. Um, we can do that using a virtual machine interpreter or a JIT compiler. JIT, remember, stands for just in time. Um, the virtual machine interpreter is actually going to look at the, at the mach virtual machine language instructions, the bytecodes. And for each one, interpret it, decide what it has to do. Um, the JIT compiler, on the other hand, will translate those instructions into the low-level native machine language. And of course, we have the ahead-of-time compiler that does that directly from the high-level language program. So the reason for this virtual machine is to create sort of a, a place where it's very easy for us uh, to compile or interpret to different architectures. That's what makes Java more portable. All right, so let's uh, focus in on the Java virtual machine. Uh, as we said, this is what makes Java more machine independent than some other languages. The Java virtual machine also provides some very strong protections for the language. 
uh, that sort of keep uh, people out of trouble, programmers out of trouble, unlike C, which lets us run amok and do anything we want with uh, the memory of, uh, and, and references into that memory. Java uses a, a stack-based execution model, and there are many different kinds of Java virtual machines. Some do more interpretation, some compiled into assembly. Uh, they're usually implemented in a language like C, however. So here's a model for the virtual machine. Um, in, uh, in, in most Java virtual machines, there's a concept of an operand stack where we put operands that we're going to uh, operate on in our procedures and code. And then a variable table uh, where we can store uh, arguments and local variables. Uh, typically, the, the zero element of the variable table always ho holds a pointer to the current objects whose code we're executing. So it would hold that pointer to this, that, ob that the object uh, in which execution is currently. Uh, then there's a space for other arguments to the method in the table and other local variables that might be in that method. Okay. Let's take a look at a quick example. Here's a Java bytecode for a very simple uh, operation, namely taking two arguments, adding them together, and, uh, and storing the result. So you'll see uh, we have four bytecodes listed here. Uh, looks kind of like assembly language, but it's, uh, it's a little bit different. You'll notice that uh, there's no names for registers. Uh, what we're doing is uh, just getting some arguments in the first two instructions and uh, putting them on the stack. Um, we're pushing the first argument of our function onto the stack, the second argument, and then we use an instruction called uh, add that pops the two elements from the stack, adds them together, pushes the result back on, and then uh, a yet another uh, bytecode called iStore that takes the result and uh, puts it back into the table at location number three. And that's the basics of bytecodes. No knowledge of registers. It just uses those references into the, uh, into the variable table. You'll also notice that these instructions are prefixed with a letter um, that signifies the data type uh, that we're working with. Uh, so I stands for integer, A for reference or address, B for byte, C for card, D for double, and so on. There's a few more. Uh, but that's basically it. Four bytes, four instructions uh, that tell our virtual machine uh, what to do. So the C program that implements the virtual machine reads each one of these bytes and says, oh, I load one. That means it wants me to uh, get an integer from the uh, variable table at location one and place that on the stack and just proceeds along executing one bytecode after another. If this were assembly language instructions, we might have something that looks like this. You notice there's a lot more detail here. There's names of specific registers in which to store things. There are specific addresses where to, in memory, when, where we have to go and put and get those uh, uh, values. Uh, that's not present here. Here we're dealing with just the stack and a variable table. Uh, all the locations are implicit based on that. And we're not worrying about addresses and where things are. We're leaving that up to the C program uh, that interprets those instructions to decide. Here's a simple Java method. Um, this method might be from a program that deals with uh, a database of employee names. This method is called uh, getEmployeeName and uh, it has no arguments. It's just going to be running in an object. Uh, that has access to the name of the employee. And you'll notice that the first bytecode is a reference uh, load, a load, get the value of this uh, stored at variable zero, uh, at uh, zero in the var table, and uh, put that on the stack. The next bytecode is a get field. It says uh, pop the stack, uh, go to that address, uh, offset it to the fifth field of the object uh, at that address, and uh, there you'll find the reference to a string for the name. 
uh, get that reference and put it back on the stack. All of that is done in that one bytecode instruction. And then finally, the last instruction is a return with an address uh, value, with a reference value. And it just pops the value that's currently on the stack and returns that as the return value of the procedure. In this case, a reference to that employee name. So that's the basic structure of a method. This URL at the bottom uh, can point you to, it points you to all the, the possible bytecodes uh, that might exist uh, for a Java implementation. This code occupies five bytes of memory. A load is in the first byte, a get field is in the second byte. Now get field is actually a byte code that requires two more bytes to tell it which particular field in the object uh, to go get. So these two bytes together are the number five. And then the last byte code, uh, the return. They might be represented by these codes. This is what is in the Java class file uh, corresponding to this particular method. The Java class file um, has everything that's associated with a class in Java. And um, there's 10 sections, actually, to a class file. There's a magic number that starts things off at the beginning, uh, a version of the format that's being used just to keep things straight as Java is updated, uh, a set of constant values uh, that are going to be used in this class, uh, some special flags to uh, differentiate whether this class or is abstract or static, uh, the name of the, of the class, its uh, super class that it inherits things from, uh, any interfaces it implements, uh, then its fields, its methods, and its attributes. All of these are packaged together in a single file. Uh, the methods here are the ones that are going to have the bytecodes uh, corresponding to the, uh, the code for uh, each of the methods in this class. And uh, this is packaged up uh, into a jar file that collects all of the class files associated with a Java program. Given that we now have lots of Java virtual machines out there, um, many designers have developed new languages that use the same bytecodes as Java, uh, but totally different uh, syntax. So this is a list of some of the languages, like AspectJ and uh, Ruby, Jython, uh, Scala, uh, that are built on top of uh, Java virtual machines, uh, use Java bytecodes, but are not Java programs. They're just using exploiting that intermediate language in order to compile to that and then have access to all the machines on which these Java virtual machines can run. So this is another way that uh, creating this intermediate layer has helped spur uh, language design in many different kinds of languages for different tasks. Okay, uh, Microsoft C Sharp and .NET Framework are another example of these same concepts. Uh, C Sharp has a lot of similar motivations to Java. And the virtual machine in this case, is, rather than uh, being a JVM, is called the common language runtime. And uh, there's a common intermediate language that takes the place of the bytecodes in the case of C Sharp. Uh, and just like in Java with many other languages using the Java bytecodes, uh, there are many languages uh, that use the common intermediate language, or CIL, uh, that uh, Microsoft developed. And uh, in this case, things like uh, J-Sharp, uh, uh, Visual Basic, uh, are all languages that uh, compile to the same uh, common intermediate uh, language that then is translated to the particular uh, machine and CPU that we want to run our code on.